Hello, my name is Lamberto Vasconcelos and for the next 45 minutes I'd like to talk to you about algorithms. We are going to cover a number of topics in, the, in this presentation and they will be presented in this order. I'll say a couple of words about myself then we'll introduce the actual topic starting with the origins of algorithms then some definitions about algorithms then how algorithms have been used to solve problems and then we'll talk about properties of algorithms when can we say that an algorithm is good for something we're then going to cover some social moral and ethical considerations and we're going to um, give you some take-home messages and provide you with some materials for further reading. So about myself, I am associated with the Computing Science Department at the University of Aberdeen. I am the second or third, depending on the search engine that you look for my first name. Um, you will find me either as the second or the third um, hit. Um, this is because my name is unusual. Um, the first and the second, if I'm not the second, the first one is a football player. The second one, if I'm not the second one with the search engine, it would be a very handsome horse. I have worked in Brazil, Switzerland and in the UK in, at the University of Edinburgh in, in Edinburgh and um, in Aberdeen, Aberdeen University. My research field is artificial intelligence. Let's look at the origin of the word algorithm. The, the name algorithm is related with the name of a 9th century mathematician, Muhammad ibn Musa al kuvarizmi And the part of the name that's been underlined here, al kuvarizmi it's called a nisba, which is the um, place of origin of that individual. It means that that person is from Kuvaratsm, and that is a place in today's Iran, but at the time it was Persia. The name was Latinized as Algorithmi. Um, this ninth century mathematician is um, has proposed um, kind of a numerical solution to a mathematical problem and again his name has been associated with an algorithm in this in this context more recently in 1928 two mathematicians Ackerman and Hilbert they proposed to the mathematic the uh, to the community of mathematicians in the world at the time at an international symposium a number of important and unsolved challenges. The tenth of these problems was called the decision problem, and it comes from the German Entscheidungsproblem. And the, the problem is stated as following, as following. Is there an effective method to decide whether a mathematical statement is true or not given a set of axioms. It doesn't seem too complicated once you get the intuition. The, the details is not so important. Ultimately, the question is, can you automate mathematics? In other words, can you create some kind of process whereby a machine would make use of a set of statements and then by operating these statements it would conclude other statements a bit like what a mathematician does when he or she creates a proof the important importance of this problem in addition to having significant uh, consequences to mathematics is that it put forward the requirement for, a, a, for one effective method. That was the embryo of 
algorithm is this notion this notion or this concept of an effective method there are many definitions some of them are intuitive and some technical and some of these definitions especially the non-technical intuitive ones they unfortunately they create confusion I'd like to first start by saying that algorithms are aimed at humans. They are not for computers. They are a way of communicating ideas among humans. They provide, they are a solution to a problem. I'll be talking about these problems, the nature of these problems in the next, in the next couple of minutes. But, but the, the algorithms will be consumed they will be read by us humans and we will make sense of it that is we'll understand how it works and if we want or if we need we might want to implement the algorithm i highlighted here as well the word implement that's a part of the the life of an algorithm whereby the algorithm is converted or translated into a programming language and then a computer will be able to run. Algorithms are not computer programs, but they are very closely related. A computer program is an implementation of an algorithm and algorithms need an implementation in order to be executed by a computer. Moreover, one same algorithm can have many different implementations using different programming languages or the same programming language can provide different implementations. Another misconception is that an algorithm is like a cooking recipe. Yes, to some extent it, to some extent it is um, a kind of a step-by-step -step recipe. But there are, there, there are some differences. First and foremost, is the different level of accuracy and precision of the operations of the individual steps. We do not allow, we do not want, we want to minimize the subjectivity in an algorithm. You may have come across some cooking recipes and they instruct people to fry or cook something until brown but you can have light brown brown or burnt brown which of them is brown it's not obvious because they don't provide you with a clearer um, instruction there's no there should be no ambiguity as well either because um, again we want ultimately to have a computer um, executing and computers do not like ambiguity it has to be very very clearly specified otherwise a computer will not be able to do it so here are some definitions of algorithm first of them is a procedure for solving a problem in a finite number of steps regretfully we are converting the definition of an algorithm into a definition of a procedure but procedure has an, um, a common, a non-technical meaning in English, and that's just a sequence of steps. The emphasis on the number of steps being finite is important, and although algorithms quite often, in fact, most of the times algorithms do involve repetition, otherwise the problem is too simple. The number of steps has to be finite in spite of the repetition and i'll illustrate this um, the next couple of slides an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem this is a kind of a ref just rephrasing the first one the third of them is the one that we're going to um, dwell on it's a finite sequence of steps to solve a problem where each step is a precise or clear operation the nature 
of the algorithms, of, sorry, of the nature of the problems that algorithms solve are well-defined mathematical problems or information-related, information processing. They require steps to be iterated or repeated. There should be repetition. If not, then the problem is probably too simple to merit an algorithm. They require some kind of repetition of steps, and that's the automation part. They use so algorithms when they are being um, described. They make use of a almost like a set repertoire of operations, and they are storing a value which might be important later on, compute the value of a mathematical expression or a mathematical formula, compare values, and repeat a sequence of steps. Let's illustrate these, these, um, these concepts with an example. We're going to study a simple problem, and the problem is how to find the smallest and largest toys in a, in a very large box of toys of various sizes. So, you are provided with this very large box with lots of toys inside. They have been shaken over and they have no order inside them. They are one on top of the other, all disorganized. And your task is how to go through these toys and get the smallest and the largest of them. Let's look at some solutions. They're going to be in increasing order of sophistication. Solution A, it just says, select the largest and, the largest and smallest toys. The issue here is that select is not obvious. It needs to be further detailed. If you, if you as an operator, someone who is going to deal with this task of finding the smallest and largest toys in the box, and you see this instruction, select the largest and smallest toys. It is not really a set of instructions. You're just repeating the problem. So select is not obvious. A solution B goes, go through all the toys and get the largest and smallest toys. Okay, at least now we know that we have to somehow go through all the toys to select the largest and smallest toys. But it's still not really a sequence of steps. Because when I'm going through all the toys, how am I going to get the largest and smallest? It's still very compact and lacks details. So, this is a more comprehensive solution. It's very detailed, probably too detailed. But this is to illustrate the level of detail that we expect in algorithms. They are so detailed that someone can carry out these operations without knowing what the operations are for, and in the end, they will get the result the expected result. Each line is numbered. This is for easy referencing. So we can talk about statement one or um, operation line one, line two, and so on. Um, there is uh, some of the um, words have been written in boldface. I'm going to explain this in the next slide. But for the time being, Let's just follow the process top down, left to right. So you basically go through this as if you're reading a book. And the lines, as I said before, it just helps us to, uh, well, one, to be able to easily refer to the lines, but also it provides us with the order in which the operations have to be carried out. The, the solution requires two people. It's not really um, extra resources, it's just that, that we're going to use both our hands to hold the toys, the smallest and the largest. 
and we need someone else to get the toys out of the box one at a time that's the reason why we needed um, a helper we we'll start by us the, the per we are going to be the ones op um, running putting the algorithm to use as it were so we're going to push our hands into the box and pick two toys at random once we have these two toys in front of us we're going to do a very simple um, check on line two we're going to decide which of these two toys are the smallest and we're going to put the smallest of them in our right hand and the other one is going to be um, held in my left hand if they are the same size then it doesn't matter you can just hold one in each hand and then we're going to start a, re a repetition of steps four to eight and that's one of the reasons why the words are in bold face this is to alert us that at this point something is going to be um, is going to take place we're going to start a repetition and starting from four until eight and this is established because between lines five four and eight all other lines have an indentation this is to alert us who are reading the algorithm that these sentences these statements five six seven and eight they comprise a block and this block of instructions is going to be executed for each toy in the box so my helper is going to pick up one toy from the box and I'm going to look at this box it's this toy and I'm going to compare this is what I'm doing line 5 I'm doing I'm going to compare it with the toy in my right hand and if this new this toy that's just been re retrieved from the box is smaller than the one that I have in my right hand which was the smallest of the two that I beget, began with then I'll swap them over that is I'll hold this new toy with my right hand and I'll drop the old toy that was in my right hand onto the floor I'll do the same but comparing the toy with the left hand that is if the toy that's just been produced by my helper out of the box is larger than the one that I have in my left hand then again I'll do the same I'll swap them over dropping the toy that was that used to be my left hand onto the floor and I now have a new largest toy so from this line 8 that I swap them over mind you um, the if and the then are also um, in bold face again this is to alert us that there is a comparison going on here the other ones don't have so much of a they don't have any bold face um, words because they don't they are just um, recording values or um, doing one-off operations notice that after line 8 we don't go to line 9 because this is in a loop this is in a repetition so we're going to go back and try another toy in the box with the help of my helper and we're going to do this repeatedly until we run out of toys in the box at the end of this loop we'll have a whole lot of toys lying on the floor the box will be empty and I'll have two toys one in each hand and I can guarantee to you that at this point when the box is empty the toys that I have in my hands will be the smallest on my right and the largest in my left hand so this is the kind of level of detail that we expect in an algorithm the instructions to be very detailed and it should be possible for someone to just follow them without previous knowledge or being an expert in the field of say toys the as far as the notation is concerned and we, we I, I pointed out 
that algorithms are to communicate ideas among among human humans. So, the presentation of an algorithm is very important because if we make it easy for people to understand an algorithm, then they are more likely to understand the algorithm. So every help that we can provide is going to be welcome. The presentation that we saw before, it's what we call pseudo code. It's pseudo code because it's not quite code that a computer can run. There are still things written in English and computers, well, they do understand English these days, but not for an algorithm. Um, we have a sequence of steps. They can be numbered or not, but one step per line, again, just to improve visibility, no, sorry, visualization, just to make it easy to visualize what each statement, uh, where each statement begins and where it ends. Each step has to be clearly stated in the sense of, is this a value being stored? Is this an, uh, a formula being computed? Is this a, a loop that I'm going to perform and so on? Some words are in boldface and they refer to common operations, iterations, comparisons. And as I pointed out, we also use indentation to improve readability. This notation is very close to many programming languages. However, pseudocode is technology agnostic. It doesn't get so close to a programming language that it can be run by a computer. So we stop a way, a, a, a way away from an actual programming language. And pseudocode can be implemented in different languages. Pseudo, so an algorithm can be expressed as pseudocode and pseudocode can be implemented in different languages. This is the same message that I said before. An algorithm can be implemented in different languages or in the same in one same language but in different ways. It's important to notice that algorithms all the way back from the 1940s and 1950s are still relevant these days. This is important especially in these days that new programming languages are coming along every every couple of years and then programming languages come in and out of fashion. So to be able to um, establish a solution in a way that will survive the passing of time is very, very important. There are issues here and these issues have been addressed by, again, mathematicians. Um, what should individual steps be like in order to be um, effectively computed or that they should be simple enough or well-defined enough that even a computer can perform them. Um, well, okay, we could just say they should be executable by a computer. But this study dates back from the early 1900s and there were no computers at the time. So we're looking at um, a field. There were an in, in a field in which experts, scientists, were doing their research on what could be computed, but yet they had no computers. They came up with two ingenious ideas, very, very interesting, very powerful, and they survive the passing of time. These are Turing machines and the lambda calculus. Let's look at Turing machines first. They've been proposed by Alan Turing in 1936, way before computers um, were around. Um, Alan Turing, um, you may have heard of him. He, um, he has been in the subject of films and books and um, theater plays. He was um, a, a mathematician. He worked in um, various areas and specifically in computing, well, not so much computing, in theory of computation, he made significant advances. He came up with a concept of an effective procedure, which is a precise notion of an algorithm. He put forward a mathematical model. Although the name has machine, Turing machine, 
it's not an actual device with cog wheels and cables and valves and buttons. It's just a, con a concept. It's just a formal definition, if you like. However, it had all the components that you would need in order to build a computer, which is fascinating given that at the time there were no computers. So a true visionary. The features of a Turing machine, and we show here, I'm showing here a kind of a stylized um, diagram of a Turing machine, but I'll explain what the components are. You have an infinite tape here. And this infinite tape has um, is all divided into cells. So they have um, a set, of, sorry, a sequence of discrete cells, and there is a head that you can read what's on each cell, and you can write on each cell one cell at a time. The head can move forwards or backwards. It's a bit odd to think of the head moving when normally you can remember, some of us can remember tapes, like cassette tapes and video cassette tapes. The head didn't move. It was the tape that went forwards and backwards. In here, it would be a bit more convoluted to think of a tape going forward or backwards because the tape is infinite. So the trick then is to use the head to move. So, but the end effect is the same the head can check, can move for, from one cell to another. There is a, a mechanism that can be programmed, and that's the actual algorithm, that controls everything. So the, the, the control will establish, for instance, you should now read what's on the tape, and if the value is something, then you do something. Or you can say, go until the end of the string, or go until um, uh, move forwards or backwards until you find character one and so on. Let's look at an online demo to see how things come together. So this is a, a simulator of a Turing machine and we're going to look at a specific um, problem here is the problem of recognizing whether a word is um, a palindrome. A palindrome is a word that if read back to front, it's the same as if read front to back. So ABBA, A-B-B-A, that pop group, is a palindrome because if you read back to front is ABBA, and if you read front to back is ABBA as well. So we're going to start, I'm typing here the input that I'm going to start. This is um, a palindrome and we're going to reset and the, this is the, the, the simulation of the tape. You have the head which is currently reading the first character of the string. Now the tape can be is infinite to the left and infinite to the right so we're not going to represent it. The head moves one cell at a time according to um, um, the algorithm. This is the algorithm. I'm not going to go into the details here. I'm just going to show you how the, the, the Turing machine concept works. So the way this program to check whether a string is a palindrome works is this very simple. You basically start with the, the beginning of the tape and you read the character at the beginning of the tape. Say, in here we have, a, we have one. We overwrite it with a blank because we we process this, and we're going to move to the to the end of the tape, and check if the last character of the tape is also one. If it is, then we're good. We go back to the beginning, and repeat the same. We check the first character, which now is the second, and uh, overwrite it with a blank, and move to the end of the tape until we find one same character at the end of the tape. This way we are eating characters from each end of the string. The beginning and the end, the beginning and the end. Uh, they, if the characters are always the same, eventually you run out of characters because the string will, will, will be all overwritten one character at a time with blanks and the whole tape will be blank. And then we know it's a palindrome. If 
any other possibilities arise, it's because there was a mismatch between the beginning, the, the first character and the last character, meaning that the, the string is not a palindrome. Let's look at it. So, reading the first character, and it's going to be, oh, sorry, I should have done step at, at one step at a time, sorry. I'm going to go one step at a time. Now, the first character was overwritten, and we had now a blank. I'm now going to, so the convention is, whatever character the head is reading, it shows in red. We're now going to the end. How do we get to the end? It's when we find the first blank. The tape is infinite, so the string sits anywhere in the tape, so you have an infinite number of blanks to the left, an infinite number of blanks to the right. But if you reach the first blank, it means that you got to the end of the string. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to the big. No, we're going to go one character back to check whether it was, it is a one, and it is. Okay, we're good. We overwrite this with a blank. And we now go to the beginning. And the beginning is this zero. We're going to overwrite it and go to the end, which is just the next, oh, sorry. The end is go one beyond. Now you go back and the zero matched the first zero that we just um, ticked off. And that's it. The next steps are just to put a smiley to say we're good. Um, the this, that um, uh, demo is this algorithm here. It's the same, it's the same um, process here, but it's just written in the first cell. Then you record what that cell was. If it's a zero, you call A. If it's not a zero, it's because it's one. And we're assuming here that you only have zeros and ones on the tape. If not a zero, then you record a state B. You overwrite, this, you overwrite the cell with a blank, and then you move the head to the right until the end of the string, which is the first blank cell. Move the, move the, the head uh, left one cell, which is the rightmost cell, and then you check. If the cell is zero and the state is A, that is, you had ticked off a zero to begin with, or if the cell is one and I had found as a one when I at the beginning of the tape, then I can overwrite the cell with a blank and I move the head to the left until the blank symbol and head move the head one cell to the right, which takes us to the start of the reduced string. If this condition if this is not the case and this is not the case, then it's because the string is not a palindrome. There was a mismatch between the first character and the last character. That's not a miss. That's not uh, a palindrome. Hence, you just stop there. Now, if the tape is all blank, it means that the string is a palindrome because eventually you um, you over you erased or you put a blank on all the cell, all the characters, and that's good. Otherwise, we go to two. So this is a different way of establishing repetition. You go back to state 2, which means you, you carry on doing the same um, steps from 2 to 10. And eventually, you either get that the string is not a palindrome, or the tape becomes all blank, in which case the string is a palindrome. So it's a, it's a very, very detailed um, sequence of steps. And this is in line with the toy, the, the, the box of toys that you have to make everything very, very explicit and obvious. But also the nature of the operations here, which is what this discussion is about, is very precise. You can read a cell, you can write onto a cell, you can move the head to the left and to the right, one position. If you need to do more than one, you have to create a loop and so on and so forth. So the nature of the operations are very, very specific here. You have this repertoire of operations and these are the only ones that you can perform. And this is exactly what computer scientists do these days. They come up with a solution that has um, a representation of the problem in some sequence of characters. In this case here we're using zeros and ones. Ultimately, 
computers these days still use zeros and ones. They are digital computers. Digital is because all the information is recorded as zeros and ones. So a Turing machine defines what an effective computation is. In other words, Turing machine, uh, sorry, uh, Turing this, um, uh, proposed the following. Look, there's so much debate about the nature of these operations, and here's my suggestion. I have this device that is conceptual. It's just a mathematical definition, but it gives us at least some grounding for us to create our um, algorithms. However, these operations are very, very low level. Simple machines require very long specifications of what to do, and the problems become very... Um, they, so, some of the problems that we tackle with Turing machines are very simple, like checking for um, whether a string is a palindrome. If the, the problem and the solution becomes more sophisticated, then it's a very difficult task to create a Turing machine. And Turing machines, even the, the simple ones, are very hard to read and make sense of. So, we can be a bit less detailed because Say, if you're talking to someone else who knows about Turing machines, you say, well, I know how this would, would, would have been done. So we could say, zigzag the tape until something happens. You know, you go forwards and backwards and you say, you erase every other symbol or something. You can also state, or oh, replace all ones with zeros. So we know how this can be done. We don't have to provide the sequence of steps for this. But we will need to share this um, common knowledge that, okay, I know what kind of operations Turing machines can do. And if someone comes up with, okay, there is a step of my uh, algorithm, which is find the best shares to buy. Sorry, this is not something that you can specify as an as operation of a Turing machine. This has to be detailed. So there is a claim um, that... I'd like to put forward is that algorithms should have a corresponding Turing machine. This is one that is widely accepted by the computing um, community. An algorithm should have a corresponding Turing machine. The level of um, detail of a Turing machine is quite low, very specific, a very, very um, simplified set of operations. But ultimately, any algorithm should have a corresponding Turing machine. If you cannot provide a Turing machine, even in this um, less detailed um, fashion, then it is not an algorithm. It's black magic or wishful thinking. Turing machines predate computers and programming languages. You saw the dates 1936. But there is a convergence of ideas that gave rise to early computers. This is one of them. Early programming languages were very low level, um, less so than Turing machines, but they also uh, entail very long sequences of basic operations. And the early programs were very error prone and difficult to understand and change. We've now had generations of computers and programming languages. Programming languages like Java, Python, C, and so on, are all Turing complete they can compute anything a Turing machine can. So we have algorithms as pseudocode now using a basic set of constructs because we know that these constructs, ex they are provided by these programming languages and these programming languages are Turing complete. We have comparisons, if then else, repetitions, do something until a condition, recording value and calculating the result of arithmetic expressions. But I mentioned lambda calculus. What about it? Ah, okay. The proponent was Alonzo Church, and lo and behold, 1936. So these ideas were around, and these mathematicians were trying to make sense of solutions to them, to these problems. Um, unfortunately, it's a, a less intuitive proposal and takes longer to present. Um, it, they have the same expressive power as Turing machines. This was, um, this is a, a famous um, th thesis, uh, is it a uh, church Turing th thesis that establishes that they have the same expressive power. But the idea is to use 
functions, as in mathematic, mathematical functions, as a way of defining algorithms. So what kind of problems algorithms take, um, tackle? The, the, the problems are well defined. For instance, how an, an algorithm or a solution to um, buy a winning lottery ticket is not one of them. The examples of the problems are sort a list of numbers in ascending order, count how many times a name appears in a list, finding prime numbers. These are very simple to define. They all, uh, they have all the required information or input is given. In our toy example, you had a box of toys. The task outcome is clearly stated. We wanted the largest and the smallest of the toys. However, don't be fooled. A problem that can be stated easily or in, in a couple of sentences can be very hard to solve. Some simple problems do not even have solutions. Let, let's look at some of these. So, um, algorithms will be implemented and their implementation will, for instance, um, tell us how much tax we need to pay. It will also control the brake systems of cars, um, you know, the anti-lock anti braking systems system of a car works by having um, an algorithm controlling how much of the pressure that you apply on the pedal will be transferred onto the, the actual tire. Other algorithms decide on the amount of radiation that a patient will receive when they are undertaking, say, radiotherapy. We need guarantees of algorithms in their implementation because if things go wrong, if the algorithm isn't up to scratch, if they don't really solve the problem, we can be in a great deal of danger. So here are some properties that we should study and ultimately determine to what extent the algorithm has that property. Does it always stop? Will it terminate? Does it always provide a correct answer? That is, the correctness of the solution. If it works for all inputs, that is, the algorithm is a complete solution. And how long it takes, the complexity of time, and how much memory it requires, that's the complexity of space. These are some properties of algorithms that we need. Let's look now at time complexity. Some problems have an algorithm, the algorithm terminates, the algorithm is correct, but it takes a, just a little bit too long. However, let me start by saying that when the, the mathematicians started the study of time complexity, they didn't have computers, so they didn't use a clock, a stopwatch, to measure how long the algorithm took. Remember that an algorithm is for humans. It wouldn't be like a very fast human a person trying to impersonate a computer running an algorithm. That wouldn't still that would that wouldn't be fair. So the time is not measured by clock, it's measured by how many times steps will be performed. It depends on the size of of the it depends on the size of the input information. As the size of the input increases these steps will be performed more. Refer back to the uh, palindrome Turing machine. If we had a longer string, the number of steps will be repeated more and more. Technical, the technical term is we're looking for asymptotic time complexity, which is we just want to study how th uh, when input grows, the size of the input grows, how much more uh, how, how many more times we'll need to compute the steps. An example to illustrate this is the traveling salesman problem. And that is a problem whereby we have someone who needs to visit a number of towns. But to optimize the, the travel, say, to reduce fuel costs, you don't want to go past the same town twice. You want to create some kind of route whereby you go past a town once and you don't have to go past the same town more than once. So the, the brute force algorithm would try out all possible routes, you know, A, B, C, C, B, A, and then would create eventually a route. And when looking at this uh, table here, I'm just putting side by side the number of towns and the number of steps required to try out all possible routes. 
For 10 towns, you would have to try out things and the overall number of steps would be 1,000 steps. For 20 towns, it would be over a million. For 30 towns, it would be over a billion. For 40 towns, over a trillion. For 50, it's one followed by 15 zeros. For 100, it's one followed by 30 zeros. So a small increase in the number of towns causes a dramatic increase in the number of steps. This is the case in many solutions. And it's not because computer scientists and mathematicians are inept or incompetent. It's because the problems are complicated. And for these problems, the only solutions we have to this point have this property of the exponential increase in the number of steps. To have an idea of what this number would um, entail, if we could use the fastest computer that we have today available in the world, this problem with 100 towns would take us 31 million years to be solved. The, the next part of the presentation, we are nearly, nearly at its end, um, it's more um, taking stock of algorithms in today's society. The term didn't attract much attention until 2005 or thereabouts, and then all of a sudden it's all over the media. I have my theory to explain how um, this um, growth in popularity interest. Mobile devices are now gathering data in an unprecedented scale. We are providing data to um, lots of companies, governments and so on. AI, artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, is using this data to do all kinds of impressive things. Companies now realize that data combined with machine learning means a lot of money. Machine learning has also made impressive breakthroughs and there has been a massive investment from large corporations into AI research. It seems now that algorithm is almost um, it's, um, a synonym for what computers, for what humans did and now a computer does much better. It's been in the news. AI can predict breast cancer with 97% accuracy. AI beat world chess champion Kasparov. AI can detect 50 eye diseases with the same accuracy as a specialist. And then you have, just to counter all these fantastic news, the um, exam results fiasco in England, and it was blamed on an algorithm. So we are providing data to the government as well as companies. Um, we benefit from these algorithms, say error detection of cancer. We may also be contributing to initiatives we do not approve of. Stop the treatment for some conditions because of cost benefits, spread of disinformation, fake news, or the killing off of small independent businesses. The idea here is you should, we should all ask ourselves, Am I aware how algorithms are affecting me? By providing me with social media contents? By suggesting to me what I should watch? Or recommending to me what I should buy? Large corporations spend vast amounts of money in algorithms. They will not tell you how they are using your data, nor how they can control and affect you. This is their business. If they do tell us that, then they are letting out an industrial secret. Unfortunately, this will only get worse. There are many important moral, ethical and legal issues related to algorithms. More recently, they have been accused of bias. The algorithms that we're talking about that made the name so popular, they by and large analyze data and they work by finding trends and using these trends. We don't care so much if we get a recommendation that we don't like. We will just ignore it. But we will care if we are discriminated against concretely. An example is if you try to apply for health insurance or life insurance and you happen to live in a community 
and the data of that community shows that the community um, is deprived, underprivileged, and so on, you will be bundled with that community, and your premium could be quite high. Even though you're healthy and you're young, you'll be deemed as someone who, because you are in that community, you will be treated like the normal, sorry, the average person of that community. There are serious moral, ethical, and legal issues. Um, a moral issue is no one would agree to racial profiling. No. However, back in the um, year 2000s, um, a, f a, a camera, a photographic camera was released and it boosted that it had facial recognition. The thing was the algorithm that did the facial recognition would not um, recognize dark faces. If someone had the skin tone slightly dark, they would not be recognized. This is the worst case of racial profiling ever. Ethical, would, we, would you hire a driverless taxi to carry someone that you love somewhere? This is an interesting situation because it's, well, for us, we're probably managed by ourselves, but if someone that is dear to us, we would think twice. Moreover, the driverless, driverless taxi, in addition to issues of safety, um, it's taken away the job of a human who is no longer employed to drive a taxi. Legal aspect is if an autonomous vehicle kills someone or an algorithm decides that certain patient is to get more or less treatment and the algorithm is wrong, who is to blame? The programmer? The person who authorized the use of the algorithm, there is, is still a lot that has to be answered for. And because we're in the legal realm, this is something that lawyers would have a field day. The computing science community are reacting to this, and we are starting to study um, aspects of transparency, explainability, and accountability of algorithms. The transparency refers to all the data that the algorithm uses um, and how it's been used would be recorded. Explainability is that the algorithms should be able to explain how and why decisions were made. And the accountability is that there should be a clear line of command when things go wrong. So the main points or the take home messages are algorithms are not the same as a program. They are means for humans to communicate ideas, a sequence of steps, and each step is a precise, clear operation, closely related to Turing machines, they have to have guarantees, and they have many moral, ethical, and legal issues. These are some extra reading and view materials for those who want to um, take this, um, this topic further. And that's us. Thank you for your attention.